All right, welcome everybody. Um, if this is your first time joining, thank you for being here and everyone else, welcome back. Um, let us know where you're joining from, kind of take a minute to drop your location in the chat. I'm Christina Miller, founder and consultant at Christina T. Miller Sustainable Jewelry Consulting. We provide strategy, guidance, and education on responsible sourcing and sustainability for the jewelry industry. I'm here today with Ana Brazetite, our education director, and Cecilia Echeverri, our operations director. If you'd like to find out more about us and our services, you can check out our website. We're dropping those links into the chat. And this, the living room, is an informal virtual hangout to support community and connection on issues related to sustainability and responsible sourcing and jewelry. We cover different topics every month and we love to hear from everyone. So we keep the chat open and you can feel free to share feedback on topics you would like to see discussed, structure changes, anything that you would like to share with us about the living room so that we can serve you better with it. Uh, we have a questionnaire that you can add to. So we wanna thank everyone who uh, has shown up for this conversation and continues to arrive. Thank you very much to those who contributed via our pay what you want option. Um, this is really helpful and we're happy to be able to provide these sessions. Thanks for your support. So as a reminder, we are recording. So these videos do end up in the pub public realm and you're welcome to speak up and ask questions, put your questions in the chat, but when you're not speaking, please stay muted. And with respect for everyone here, please, if you're private messaging each other, keep it kind. Um, the private chats should be respectful of participants' privacy and personal space. So it's up to you if you wanna answer, if someone reaches out to you in a private chat, um, be kind to each other. If you want to ask a question or have a comment, put it in the chat. And as always, if you want to stay up to date about the living room sessions and our work in particular, uh, we have a subscription service so that you can keep in touch. Our next and last living room session for 2022, I can hardly believe we're at the end of the year, will be November 18th. We're going to be doing a deep dive into jewelry specific laws as they are now and to anticipating pending changes and future developments. Tiffany Stevens and Sarah Yude of Jewelers Vigilance Committee, it's a US based organization, will share their insights with us. Um, and before we start, if you aren't already aware, CMC has a new online at your own pace course available. Yay! The course is a foundation. It's a way of thinking. It's a reminder that because we built the current reality we exist in, we can also change it. It will give you a better sense of what issues to be looking for when vetting supplier claims to better understand how to use language to describe what you are learning. And then as you move forward, working to build deeper awareness into your practices. The moment you've been waiting for, the actual session, we're gonna get started. So at this time, I'd really like to introduce our presenters. I'm gonna be um, introducing them in the order they'll appear over the course of the living room session. So at this time, again, reintroducing Ana Brazetite, our education director. Our next presenter will be Dr. Karen Westland. And I had the good fortune to meet Karen in person this past July in New York, thanks to the initiatives in Art and Culture Gold Conference. Dr. Karen Westland will speak about the ethical making pledge created by the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust, its origins and how it's being rolled out. Then as a case study of the pledge being implemented into a course curriculum, Lisa McGovern, course leader at the City of Glasgow College, will share how the college has been able to respond to the specific pledge points. And then we'll hear from Karen Smith, 
who one day decided to travel to Senegal to learn traditional jewelry techniques and is now going to share with us her experiences creating an education program for her organization, We Wield the Hammer. At this time, I welcome all of you and hand it over to Anna. Thank you, Christina. We just have a quick introduction for everyone. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Um, many of you here have been really instrumental in bringing the perspective of jewelry and metalsmithing educators to the forefront of our living room discussions, which are usually a little more focused on the jewelry business side of things. So um, we thank you for that. And this then led to some behind the scenes conversations with um, Russell Artman and Curtis Arima. Hey all <laughs> from the California College of the Arts around the creation of a guidance document for sustainable jewelry education that could be implemented at any and all jewelry and metal smithing schools and programs. We're also grateful to the Ethical Metalsmiths Education Committee for taking the initiative to help us organize the run-up show for this session and for offering to continue this work through their upcoming International State of Practice webinar. So we are really aiming for today to be the beginning of a collaborative process of an action group working toward clear guidelines in responsible and sustainable practices in jewelry and metalsmithing education programs. And here are our areas of focus and the questions that we are keeping in mind as prompts. Who has access to jewelry education? What are students learning and what should they be learning? And how do we find solutions within entrenched systems? And of course, when we consider these questions, we want to make sure we are considering them through a lens of the different domains of sustainability, environmental, economic, and cultural. So we've asked, what are students learning and what should they be learning? We're wondering if the curricula of jewelry education programs is really preparing students to head out into the world and build responsible and sustainable jewelry practices. So here we have just a few examples of points to consider through the lens of each domain of sustainability. What we're starting off with here is of course, not an exhaustive list of considerations as fleshing all of this out is going to be a part of this whole working process, but it's meant to lay a little bit of the groundwork. Um, when it comes to environmental sustainability, uh, are students learning the environmental impacts of not only their studio practices, like proper chemical use and considering their packaging, et cetera, um, but the environmental issues around their material sourcing as well. In regard to economic sustainability, does the curriculum include topics such as supporting economic development in artisanal mining communities or discuss the topic of a living wage in the jewelry industry? And looking at this through a lens of cultural sustainability invites the question of how and to whom are skills and traditions passed down. The second prompt is about who has access to jewelry education and how does this therefore impact the diversity of who is represented within the industry. So while this people focus prompt begs more considerations within the realms of cultural and economic sustainability, these domains are always intersecting and impacting each other. So we want to make sure that um, a multitude of experiences and perspectives are considered and included in the creation of new systems and curricula. Economic sustainability considerations are once again related to economic development and living wages. But here we also want to consider how things like the systemically created wealth gap between white folks and people of color need to be redressed through scholarships, additional funding of programs, mentorship opportunities, and more. Additional cultural sustainability considerations include a holistic view of who has decision-making power. 
um, considering when folks with more privilege should give up a seat at the table to make sure that harmful power dynamics aren't continually perpetuated. And the bare minimum task of understanding the diversity of experiences currently within the jewelry industry and acting to create a more equitable industry. We're here for conversation today, but one that leads to collective action. Starting with how students enter into the jewelry industry will help us shape the future of this space uh, by building diversity, equity, and inclusion policies into the guidance. We can then have greater accountability later on as well. Uh, lastly, we have the question of how do we create solutions within some of these entrenched systems? Some of the obstacles we've heard from educators are not being able to get their budget approved for artisanal mine, or artisanally mined materials that often carry a premium, that opportunities are not afforded equally, and the current and currently felt impacts of an industry built on colonialism, and that creating a curriculum that includes and considers all of these topics is really a huge undertaking. So that's why we're all here today in this living room session and in the upcoming International State of Practice and whatever working group this hopefully leads to. We invite anyone here who would like to continue to be a part of this effort to uh, take part in the upcoming sessions and keep in touch, share with us examples of what is working so that we can pull together these successes and continue to dive deeper. The end goal is to create an all-encompassing standard and guidance document for sustainable jewelry education. And right now we're exploring what that should contain and the feasibility of implementing such a tool. So we're going to get started with our guests and what is uh, one great step in that direction, which is the Ethical Making Pledge. And Karen Westland will be presenting that for us. So. Let's see if I can just turn off my share. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, Christina, are you able to turn off my screen share for some reason? I can't, I'm moving my cursor. I can't get to that button. Oh, wait, I got it. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. You got it. No worries. Hey, hello everyone. Hopefully you can see my presentation. Looks great. Yep. Perfect. Um, yeah, so thank you, Christina and Anna. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to share what the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust has been doing uh, to support ethical making education in Scotland and more recently across the UK. Um, so I guess this is very much a kind of case study of Scotland, um, which hopefully it can be, um, yeah, you can learn things for hopefully a kind of US context. Um, so the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust, or SGT from here on in, is a charity that uh, supports and promotes the education, art and craft of jewellery and silversmithing heritage and trade in Scotland. Um, and through this talk, I'll introduce um, a bit about the SGT and one of our four programmes um, of activity, which is the Ethical Making Programme, um, for a bit of context before diving into the Ethical Making Pledge itself. Um, so hopefully my slides moved on. Um, so first of all, a bit of background information. Um, the SGT was founded by the incorporation of goldsmiths of the city of Edinburgh. The incorporation received its royal charter in 1687 and through its trade as the Edinburgh Assay Office, the hallmarking authority for Scotland since 1457, makes it the oldest business in the country. Um, until recently, the work we do in SGT was under the name of the incorporation. Um, but since 2020, we've moved all sort of non assay office work across to the SGT um, and we deliver a wide range of programmes to support and promote Scottish jewellery and silversmithing. Um, so our, our charity is connected to a long history of providing quality assurance via hallmarking services um, for consumers of precious metals. 
Um, and furthermore, um, sort of as a charity, we don't have a uh, sponsors, um, which enables us to maintain a kind of neutral a neutral stance um, in the kind of ethical making field. Um, so more kind of broadly, one of our core projects is the Elements Festival of Jewellery, Silver and Gold, um, that we run in partnership with the Auction House Line in Turnbull in Edinburgh. Um, and this is an annual festival that showcases work um, of 50 contemporary makers across the UK. Um, and this year our exhibition is the Goldsmiths Craft and Design Award winners. Um, and this sort of celebrates both the trade and craft. Um, our 2018 exhibition was Perspectives, Creating Jewellery for a Fairer Future, um, which explored sort of, uh, different ways in which makers can address e the ethical implications of making with precious metals and also alternative materials. Hey, Karen, this is Christina. Um, yep. Your slides aren't advancing. Well, they're not advancing. Okay. No. Um, let's okay. see. So oh, now it's it... on four, I think, yeah. Okay. The silversmithing workshop. Okay. Uh, perfect. Right, Thanks. I'll just make, I'll try and make sure that they are continuing along. Um, so yeah, hopefully you're back to that one. Uh, okay, so we're currently, uh, we're also currently developing a new silversmithing workshop in the Scottish borders at Marchmont House. Um, and this is a privately owned estate dedicated to traditional crafts. Um, and the owner, Hugo, is passionate about the arts and crafts movement and providing an opportunity for craft businesses to flourish. Um, and we were gifted the entire workshop contents of the late Graham Stewart, um, one of Scotland's master uh, silversmiths who sadly died in 2020. Um, the workshop will provide a fully equipped working space for an experienced silversmith and three emerging makers, as well as a bench space for a residency program. Um, and the grand opening is set for March 2023. Um, so we welcome all silversmiths to keep an eye out for this residency program, um, which will be open to international makers. Um, so hopefully we're moved along to the next slide. So I keep jumping back. Um, so I'll now briefly introduce the Ethical Making Programme, which is run in partnership with Goldsmith Centre in London, um, which the Ethical Making Pledge is a part of. Um, so the pledge activities are managed by myself and Iona as part of the broader team at the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust. Um, so please do get in touch anytime if you've got questions um, or any kind of feedback. Um, and we both do kind of work uh, part time, so two days a week on the programme, but we'll aim to reply as quickly as we can. Um, so the Ethical Making Resource is a website for anyone looking for information about responsible and sustainable making practices uh, in jewellery and silversmithing specifically. Um, and this is often used as an educational tool within the kind of colleges or institutions to support their sort of student awareness um, of the kind of key challenges and initiatives in our industry. Um, the resource is free to access and has a section dedicated to the pledge, um, which I recommend looking into after today's uh, living room session. Um, the resource covers um, the basics um, for people that don't know anything about eth kind of ethical making or kind of the behind the scenes of our industry um, and signposts to many different suppliers, organisations and a uh, research. Um, and we do sort of take an impartial stance in this environment and, in and aim to sort of encourage people to research and have conversations um, with their sort of suppliers or organisations. Um, okay. Um, so we also have our Ethical Making Symposium, which is the second kind of, of three parts of the programme. Um, so since 2017, we've held an annual symposium around the themes of ethical making. 
Um, these events were usually held with are usually held within Scottish colleges, um, and the audience is a kind of mixture of students, educators, independent makers, and industry professionals. Um, and in 2017, um, at the time, very few were kind of aware of the complex supply chain challenges of our industry. Um, and it was the kind of the response of kind of collective shock about the negative impacts that the jewellery industry had uh, and a desire to learn more to create positive change that led us to develop the ethical making programme um, and also the pledge specifically. Um, so hopefully my slides are continuing along. Please let me know if that's not the case. Um, so the ethical making pledge. Um, the Ethical Making Pledge is a collaborative and community-based initiative for jewellery and silversmithing education, uh, educational institutions to embed practical and theoretical learning about ethical making across the UK to prepare the next generation of makers. Um, originally, the Ethical Making Pledge was developed by the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust um, in collaboration with course leaders um, from across the colleges in Scotland um, and was first signed in March 2018 um, by college department heads from all seven of the art colleges in Scotland, um, offering jewellery courses at HMD level and above. Um, so this really kind of signified the college's commitment to implement ethical making practices into the curriculum, um, workshop practices and uh, to address the sourcing of materials. Um, so since the launch of the ethical making resource and pledge, there's been an increasing awareness of ethical issues among students and makers in, and makers in Scotland um, as more jewellers and silversmiths enter the trade with an ethical practice as their foundation. Um, and the pledge also received a um, parliamentary motion of support from the Scottish Government in 2018. Um, and due to this sort of success um, and, re and also a kind of recent partnership with the Goldsmith Centre in 2021 um, on the ethical making programme, um, the pledge now includes educational in institutions um, across the rest of the UK and a educational institutions that aren't higher educational institutions. Um, so that could be um, you know, a, institutions like We Wield the Hammer or Brooklyn Metalworks, for example. Um, so in early June, we're really pleased to have the Goldsmith Centre be the first institution outside of Scotland to sign the pledge, um, which will support the education of their foundation students and their apprentices. Um, more recently, uh, in September, leaders from our four or from the four independent institutions across Scotland collectively signed the pledge, um, which will support their students on like short courses or foundation programmes um, in their kind of ethical making uh, learning. Um, students from these institutions sometimes move on to higher education, um, so it was a natural link to include these institutions into the initiative. Um, and to sort of support ethical making thinking and doing early in the learning process. Um, so here is a list of the pledge points, um, which are points that the signatory um, institutions strive to address. Um, so signing the pledge is a commitment to work towards these points, um, which I'll read through now. Um, so point one is around sharing the ethical making pledge with staff and students in the department. Um, and this can be as simple as sign it, uh, pinning a kind of copy of the pledge document onto a notice board. Um, pledge point two is around nominating two student ambassadors each year who will take part in biannual information sessions with us and who will support uh, and the adoption of ethical making practices within the department. Um, so student ambassadors help ensure that the ethical making pledge is fit for purpose um, and increase student awareness of the pledge and of ethical making within the institution. Um, point three is around working towards the transition to ethical metal sourcing in the department with our support. 
Um, and this involves sort of considering the types of metals supplied within the department, whether in a kind of general sense or for specific projects. Cameron, the uh, slide didn't move right now. Oh, it's, sorry. We're on four right now, yes. We're on four now, okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep checking that it does update. Um, point four is around incorporating ethical making into the curriculum with the goal of writing ethical making awareness into curriculum requirements. Um, so different colleges have addressed this point in different ways, um, whether by creating their own projects around ethical making um, or course modules um, or considering the kind of broader strategies within their curriculum. Uh, Point five is working towards incorporating ethical making practices uh, into workshop methods and providing students with skill sets necessary to build their own ethical practice. Um, and this is a very sort of practical pledge point, uh, most mainly supported by department technicians who can inform students about the changes made in the workshop and to outline different options available for different materials or processes. Uh, and then lastly, point six is collaborating with us to sustain and build the pledge for future years. Um, so on an annual basis, uh, course leaders complete a survey at the end of the academic year to track their progress. Um, and we use this information in a non-judgmental way to sort of celebrate the great strides that they're making, um, but to also identify areas for future improvement. Um, and we also gather feedback from the student ambassadors to understand their perspective. Um, so the, the ethical making so student ambassadors play a kind of a real key role um, within the pledge. Um, and we hope that ambassadors will engage with our sessions because um, there's, I guess, in the kind of biannual sessions, um, we can uh, hope that we can uh, support them to act as a bridge to share information between their peers, tutors, technicians and ourselves. Um, and in some colleges, ambassadors are part of the kind of monthly student rep meetings, um, which allows this exchange of information in the kind of systems that already exist within uh, the institutions. Um, the ambassador role is considered a, student, a, a useful step for students' profes professional development, um, as they need to exercise, as they kind of need to exercise a range of different soft skills from listening to their peers um, or other ambassadors. Um, they need to think critically, um, and also have to kind of learn to develop respect and understanding for uh, differences in opinions, um, and also sort of to develop different approaches to communicate with uh, tutors and ourselves in a professional way. Um, and our collaboration with ambassadors aims to develop a range of skills in a safe environment to support their na navigation through our sort of complex supply chain issues um, so that they have some experience of this before they graduate as professionals. Um, so now for some examples. Um, so many institutions have done the same or similar things in regard to ethical making. So I am just sort of highlighting some of the kind of key activities um, that have happened. Um, so the Glasgow School of Arts are working towards embedding ethical making into their design sort of process led ed education. Um, so it's not a separate discussion from other design considerations. Um, the GSA also had a pop-up exhibition in Glasgow Central Station during COP26 um, and they have a sustainability and action group um, which supports students with uh, within any discipline to network and find positive action to take. Uh, speakers are also invited uh, to hold kind of workshops or talks um, and there's also a sustainability prize um, to recognize achievements for sort of degree show collections. Um, here are some images of degree show work from uh, this year. Um, and we've noticed a change in the approach of students where sustainable material exploration is um, subtle and embedded within their work. 
um, rather than always being at the sort of forefront of uh, the sort of design concept or aesthetic. Um, so here, sort of silver, eco resins, opals, 3D prints are being explored in relation to ethical making. Uh, DJ CAD in Dundee stock 100% recycled silver for students to use. So they've, I guess, they across their department, they've made that big change um, and teach students how to make ingots, sheet and wire from scrap metal. Um, and the technician also explains the different types of alternative materials available um, and uses bioresins in tutorials as a more sustainable option. Um, students also explore sustainability themes through research and writing on modules related to sustainable development goals, um, such as their second year change by design um, and their 21st century designer courses. Um, as with all the signatories, um, the Ed Edinburgh College of Art have a metal reclamation schedule. Um, which is clearly labelled for students, and they've also changed the safety pickle. Um, many of these practices are things that jewellers have been doing you know, since ancient times, um, but it's also been about ensuring that students are aware of the kind of financial and environmental uh, benefits of doing these things. Um, Earlier this year, um, we organised uh, the Radical Jewellery Makeover Scotland project uh, in collaboration with the Ethical Metalsmiths. Um, and this was in response to our student ambassadors who wanted to work on a project that engaged with the themes of COP26, um, but also allowed them to engage with costume jewellery, which is more accessible to them than traceable uh, kind of precious materials. Um, students and staff from across six of the Scottish colleges were involved in transforming old and unwanted jewellery into contemporary desirable designs. Um, and it was great to see an incredible turnout of visitors during the private view and students really embraced the project and we received sort of positive feedback, particularly in the way that the project connected students across year groups and institutions and the wider industry. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, so really, we kind of want students to be prepared for the future of the jewellery and silversmithing industry, um, which encompasses the ethics of how we produce our products and their material provenance. Um, our future aspirations are con to continue collaborating um, so, for example, we hope that the students uh, from the pledge signatory um, institutions will continue on to the Fair Luxury Pledge, um, which is for industry professionals. Um, we look forward to continuing our partnership with the Goldsmith Centre and our 2023 symposium will be in collaboration with at least uh, two higher educational institutions in the UK as well. Um, so I hope this presentation is really going to emphasise the benefits of this community engagement and collective action through the Ethical Making Pledge. Um, and I'll now, uh, I'll now sort of pass on to Lisa to share more about the incredible work um, that they are doing at the City of Glasgow College. So while um, Lisa gets set up and ready um, with her slides, you know, there are a couple of threads to make sure that you're all hearing through all of this. So, you know, um, I think, you know, what, what's been really uh, significant uh, for me looking at the history of things is, is everything happens on a continuum and there are multiple pockets of efforts and work happening um, all over the world, kind of simultaneously, you know, and we don't necessarily hear about each other because we're not communicating about these topics. But the ethical making pledge is sort of one of the um, most kind of concrete tools that we've seen uh, looking across the spectrum to um, unify educational institutions on a on a kind of particular trajectory. So um, Karen Westland, thanks so much for that presentation and kind of setting us up for that. And um, Lisa, looks like you're ready. Thanks. 
Thanks, Christina. Hi, so I hope everyone can see my screen okay. Is it shared? Um, so thanks, uh, Karen, um, for all the, the sort of great sort of introduction you've done there for us. <laughs> um, so basically, this is um, the City of Glasgow College here. I just thought I'd sort of put up a, an image of the college. Um, we're based in the centre of Glasgow. It's the largest uh, college in Scotland. Um, we're a further education college. So basically that, that means that we offer courses from foundation level right through to HMDs, right through to degree level. Um, a lot of our students come from, uh, the, the demographics are quite wide. It's an all-inclusive uh, college. So we get, we get a, a sort of vast variety of students coming to the college. Um, I think this is actually a, a sort of artist view of the college because it's never that sunny. Uh, and someone's walking about in a t-shirt so I know it can't be real um, but yes we like I've just sort of gathered together a few sort of snapshots from what we've been doing at the college um, my role in the college is curriculum head for craft and design so um, that encompasses jewellery design and applied arts uh, my background's uh, I came from um, a degree in jewellery and silversmithing from Glasgow School of Art many years ago then I could sort of get into lecturing and teaching, and now I'm sort of the sort of overall head of the department, but I still sort of um, teach on the programme. So in 2018, um, our college signed the Ethical Making Pledge um, with the Goldsmiths Trust. Um, I think basically before then we did, we, we had the ethos within the department um, to care about the environment and to look at and how ways of changing and, and integrating more and more, um, raising awareness with the students. Um, but by signing the pledge, it somehow made it more concrete um, and it made us really sort of start to look at things um, in more detail and to give us kind of that guideline and that sort of focus that maybe we needed. Um, it coincided with me taking on the role as the curriculum head, so it meant that um, because I was passionate about it anyway, and I think if it's instilled, instilled in you as a, as a person and as a maker, then it makes it easier for you to, to then implement these changes or to make these sort of decisions. Um, so I won't, I'm not going to go over all the, all the points that Karen so succinctly put, but I'm just going to pick on a few of them and sort of talk about ways that maybe we've implemented these changes um, and how, how, the, how it's sort of benefited us. So one of them, they're working towards the transition to ethical metal sourcing um, in the department. Um, oops, just move that out of the way. Um, so looking at practical changes, um, so a bit like Dundee, we've had made the decision to change all our uh, silver that we buy into the department as eco silver. We had we, we changed the supplier we were using. Um, our foundation level, they receive a bursary, and as part of that bursary, they used to receive a, a, a piece of silver sheet and silver wire, and we changed all that so that they'd be receiving this eco silver. Um, we recycle a lot of in-house silver, so we have a kiln room where we do our casting. So whenever possible, we try to keep that in-house and just keep recycling um, the silver as we go. Uh, wherever there's a chance to do a project um, where we can use either fair mine silver or fair trade gold, we do have a look at that. But the, the thing that maybe binds us is sort of financial and economic issues that I'm sure sort of schools and colleges all over the world have sort of got. Um, I'll talk about a bit more on that later on. Um, so whatever we can, we try to use sort of recycled um, materials. We've changed to more eco-friendly chemicals. So we're using now safety pickle. Whenever we do demonstrations, we try to use it in more natural materials. So we've done demonstrations with students on eco-patination, um, maybe electro-etching or, or trying to just show them different ways of working in different materials and different chemicals they can use that aren't quite as nasty to the environment. And um, we also show them how to dispose of them carefully um, with our technician. We're in the middle of uh, doing uh, putting a recycling area into the workshop. We've already got a sort of scrap bucket, uh, mostly of copper and brass base metals where students, if they're doing any prototyping or any sort of working on um, 
sort of their projects. That initially, they have to sort of use um, material that they found in the scrap bucket. Um, this sort of cuts down on waste when it goes to actually make their final piece. Um, so we're sort of looking at that just now and building on that area, maybe introducing more materials. We've sort of banned new plastic, so if students want to introduce acrylics in their work um, or maybe laser etch onto acrylic, then they have to source off cuts or found objects or, or uh, materials that have already been used or repurposed for something else. Um, we've got a model making department downstairs, so some of the students go down and, and rummage around their off-cut bin. Um, so we try to keep things within the department. We're lucky to be right next to the furniture department. So again, any wood, anything like that, we, we go and have a rummage. So usually we're the department that's rummaging in everybody else's bins, basically. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. Um, with all these changes as well, the practical changes, we, we try to do it year by year. We didn't do all this. We didn't just do it once in 2018. It's been a kind of gradual process and maybe seeing every year and reflecting and seeing what could we do now, what could we build on, what can we add and what can we change? So every year we try to do a bit more or, and add on a little bit more to our practical changes. These are various projects using um, recycled silver and ethically sourced stones. So some of the questions we had were, would it impact students' work changing to different materials or, or getting them to think um, about what they're using? How is it going to change the quality of their work, which it hasn't at all? That we strive to sort of, um, you know, with the quality of work, um, looking at, you know, how they, how they embed it in their work and how they're going to integrate it into various projects. Um, we invite stone suppliers into the, the college as well, where there's a traceability of their stones. So we've changed looking at the suppliers we use for gemstones. So a student on the left here had used um, a company called Gemstones Brazil. They have their own mine in Brazil um, and they're based in Edinburgh and they come through and the students can buy sort of discounted stones from them. Um, a student on the right hand side was casting in recycled silver, but she was also growing her own crystals um, in the house. Um, and we also sort of produce objects and look at object design. We don't just necessarily focus on, on jewellery making. Um, so that's just various projects where we say to students that for, for that specific project, they have to use, um, go away and look at sourcing their own ethically sourced materials and stones. Um, even though there's a, a bigger move towards sort of digital technology um, and CAD 3D printing, we do have that um, in the college. We do use 3D printing. We've introduced and bought in plant-based resin to use for all prototyping. Um, so the students can make their mistakes. They can make their prototyping without sort of using up lots and lots of silver or different materials and um, different resins, because this is resin you can actually put on your compost and it's biodegradable. So they know that there's going to be less waste. Um, and when it comes to the final print or the final make of their piece, um, then it's just one print and then um, they're just going to be casting that once in re recycled silver. Another point um, for the pledge was incorporating ethical making into the curriculum um, with the goal of writing ethical making awareness into curriculum requirements. Um, so alongside the practical activity um, and the practical materials, we also sort of try to raise awareness uh, with the students and staff um, and outside with whatever we're doing. This might be looking at the sustainable development goals, um, maybe not looking at all of them, but we might pick one or two, um, like climate action or the responsible consumption and production um, and how we can integrate them and embed them into maybe specific projects. Sometimes it can be quite difficult to do because we're tied to a system of, of modules that we have to follow that are set by the Scottish Qualifications Authority. So it's slightly different to the art schools have a slightly more free reign. Um, we have to stick to what, whatever the units are, but within that we can sort of then um, do what we like sort of thing. So how we raise awareness through project briefs. Um, we run an eco-awareness week every year. Um, we've started in um, 2019, I think it was, a school design competition. I'll speak about that later. And every year we try to do a, a green Christmas fair where everybody in the department makes a pair of earrings, a, a pendant, a small pendant using recycled silver. 
um, and we sell this in the college. Um, and that means that the public, it's open to the public and it's open to staff and students within the college and it raises awareness because we sort of put a sign up and let the students and people know what, what materials it's made of and, and why we're sort of doing that. We also um, did a project that we're going to do again called Ring in a Lunch Hour. So this is staff throughout the college could book on in their lunch hour and they come up and make a silver ring using recycled silver. They're allocated a student. Um, and it's great for the students because they get to a bit of teaching practice in their second year. They get to, um, you know, um, sort of tell and, and sort of explain to the member of staff about the, the purpose of what they're doing and why they're, why they're using the recycled silver. And for the staff member, it's great for them. They're, they're getting a chance to break away from the computer, but it's maybe opening up their um, sort of experience and knowledge about what is recycled and what the, what the goals are that the department are doing. So some of the briefs that we've done um, in first year, we, we also run an art medal project. It's the student medal project with the British Art Medal Society. So this is an annual national um, exhibition and competition. And the briefs are really down to each college. So whenever I've been running it from 2015, we've introduced um, different themes, whether it be looking at plastic pollution, light pollution, decline of the insect population and changing weather. And these are all um, briefs that the students have got. Then they have to go out and do a lot of research. So, so as they are sort of doing their design process and learning about um, carving, wax, casting, they're also looking at the theory and concepts and the sort of message that they want to get across about this sort of topical issue, how they're going to do that through a visual medium. So we're trying to bring it all together. Um, and these are just some of the great um, examples on the left hand side that some of the students were looking at. We also um, are great to have these partnerships. So we partner with the Scottish Fair Trade Forum who come in, they do lots of talks on the SDGs, they do talks on their work, they have discussions with students. This is one of the exhibitions that the Foundation uh, students did a few years ago called Home. They had to produce a piece of jewellery based on their home. Then they had to produce a piece of jewellery inspired by the home of someone else around the world in a fair trade zone. So again, it was looking at research, collecting information, um, opening up their eyes and the experience of, of what, what happens and what, what these, um, these sort of lives are like for these people and how they're going to then, using the design process, design a piece of jewellery with that as their influence. So we had um, a representative here who was judging the exhibition. Um, she produced a prize for the winner that was a, a fair trade product. We took the students to a local sort of fair trade community shop to get inspiration. And then we held the exhibition alongside a fair trade gold um, photography exhibition, uh, which was held with the Scottish Fair Trade Forum. And on the evening, the, the opening evening, we, we even tried to have the, the food there was fair trade bananas, fair trade popcorn, tea and coffee. So it's trying to sort of think about every single detail from the project, from, from the concept right through to the very end um, and trying to sort of put it all together uh, so that every part of it, we're trying to think about um, how it's ethically sourced. Uh, then as Karen said, we, we took part as well in the Radical Jewelry Makeover. Um, this was a great project for students because sometimes they are just, you know, the projects we say are very individual. Um, this was a sort of very collaborative and community based project where the students really thrived and the feedback we got was great because they all got together um, looking at the ways that the jewellery could be taken apart, how it could be put to back together and the value of taking something maybe not so precious, how to increase the value and what value is placed on non-precious um, jewellery. Um, and turning it then into a contemporary object, um, looking at what the what materials what material was made of, um, where it came from, the stories behind the donated jewellery, um, and all in all, that was a, a sort of great success for the students. And it challenged the way that they thought they were thinking about um, how to how to make the jewellery, how to connect non-precious without soldering, and um, all the different aspects to sort of making the piece as well as the the sort of um, the problems and the issues that were behind the pieces and behind how much of this is contributing to the environment and the society. Um, 
these are some of the sort of final pieces um, that were made and contributed to the exhibition at the end of it. Um, we've got so much left over, we're, we're hopefully this will be a sort of an annual project. Um, and again, in collaboration with the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust, a lot of the projects we couldn't do without their help and support. You know, they support us financially, they provide speakers, you know, even with the student ambassadors going to the symposiums and bringing back feedback from other colleges. Um, it just informs us of how we can then inform students and it, it starts to provide that sort of feedback loop from student to lecturer and back and forth, um, just creating this sort of nice dialogue. We also now have started to sort of move on to different departments. This is just um, with the Applied Arts. I've introduced this into the Art Jewelry section of Applied Arts course. Um, this was during COP26 and they had to respond to the climate change, not only through the material, but, but through their theme. Um, and this was held in the RGI Gallery in Glasgow. So whenever we're trying to, to do projects, we try to either do a live project or a competition or something that's going to increase student engagement rather than just setting them a simple task or, or having a quite a dry brief. Um, we've noticed that when it is a live project, the students really, um, it really increases the engagement. They really want to get involved because it's going to get, um, sort of go to a, a wider audience, if you like. A lot more people will be seeing it. Um, it gets them used to working to tighter deadlines and things. Um, for example, the piece in the middle that was used, um, a, it was a, a statement on fast fashion and she's used recycled, um, so the cable ties and um, sort of melted down plastic fashion carrier bags to make a sort of fashion statement piece. And the piece on the right, I think was a statement um, to do with the greed of the oil and gas companies, a sort of big medallion chain piece. So now what we're trying to do is sort of increase the, the sharing of good practice to other departments within the college. Um, we've also now got a, a sort of, we've contributed to a general um, carbon literacy model, module. Um, that's a general module that can be applied to any sort of subject within the college um, and they can apply the, whatever subject they, they have to it. In the second year, we also run a, a developing entrepreneurial skills unit. Um, so this is for point number five. So working towards incorporating ethical making practices into workshop methods and providing students with the skill set necessary to build into their own practice. So when they leave, we want to instill into them to be a responsible maker, to think about their actual practice when they leave. Some articulate onto the art schools, but some people want to, when they finish, set up their own business. So we're lucky that we um, have in the college this bridge to business. It's, it's sort of bridging the gap between when a student finishes college and to setting up their own business um, where they have to develop business plans. Um, and again, since we've sort of uh, introduced this sort of new concept, um, what we do is we get them to deliver a business plan, but throughout it, we, we sort of teach them all about um, sustainability in their practice and um, how to maybe source materials and, and what the impact is on the planet. And when we've had the business plans back, um, we've noticed over the past couple of years, the amount of students that's increased actually um, sort of integrating that into their business plan just naturally um, has been a, a really high percentage. So these are just a couple of sort of examples um, where students, you know, they're thinking about this person here, they're thinking about um, their packaging, how the packaging will be 100% recycled. They'd like to have business cards that use seed paper and can be planted once you've read the message on it. So they're actually starting to think now about their own practice um, and, and about every aspect of the practice, not just from the materials, but how they can then sort of have that as their packaging or how they can get a message across to their customer. Um, and even if one or two students, it impacts one or two students, it will then impact an audience when they get to their client based. This is annual Eco Awareness Week. So we have this every year and um, where we invite speakers. Um, there's Karen Westland um, from the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust, but in this capacity, she'd come in talking about her own work and her own ethical practices. Um, we hold demonstrations um, about maybe eco patination or how to recycle student silver, um, how to melt it down. Um, we have conversations with different um, alumni, maybe graduates that have gone on to um, embed um, ethical practices in their own work. They come back and they have conversations with us 
and it sort of inspires then the next set of students coming up saying that yes you know they can do this they can do this in their own practice this is how it's worked for these eight students um, and we hold workshops on circular design so just for that week only not just for that week but for that week only we really focus hard on sort of making it quite a um, a sort of a lot of activity and a lot of flurry going on in the department that we can sort of shout about and raise awareness. We also introduced um, a secondary school design competition. This was done a few years ago. We started off with 30 pupils um, getting involved in um, entering our competition. And then last year it was 400 students that all entered. This is done with them um, basically just asking secondary schools if they want to take part. Um, their pupils will design a piece of jewellery. We always have a sort of climate based theme again um, every year. Uh, and then the pupils will enter their designs. And then alongside, we have judges from the Scottish Goldsmiths Trust and from a, one of our suppliers um, who judge it. And then we design, we'll take the, the pupils' design and then we design it on CAD. Um, we send that away um, and that gets made up in recycled silver. And then it gets sent back to the winning student. So, so it's a really good opportunity for pupils to engage school pupils from an early age um, to get involved, to start thinking about um, the environment, to start thinking about sustainability and to start even thinking about jewellery design um, and, and to still keep up that sort of craft in the schools. Um, and to make, for us, it's good to make links with the schools because this could be our future um, generation coming in. And it's great for them to see their design going from from paper to, to a 3D um, actual pendant. Uh, this is just to end on a kind of um, overall theme that we had um, for COP26, and it sort of encompasses everything that we're trying to do. We, we used a, a design competition for the class to look at um, the rising sea levels and how it would affect the planet, whether it be in Scotland or their own area or globally, they just had to go out and research that issue. They then had to design a brooch for the First Minister to wear at COP26. Um, luckily, um, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum and Fair Mind Silver provided us with the materials to, to make the brooch. Um, so it was all using ethical um, materials. Again, it was a, a combination of digital techniques and then we um, overlaid it with kembu, which is an old ancient sort of technique of um, using foil and, um, and laying that into the silver. Um, and then the first minister wore this at COP26. So this was great because it was a it allowed a global audience. It was great for our students. It was great for um, raising the profile of the department, show showcasing what the department does. Um, and hopefully just by her wearing it um, and displaying it, then a lot more people be aware of, of any sort of all these issues. Um, these are just some of the challenges I guess we've faced um, and I think it's probably universal across lots of colleges and schools where the challenges um, may be financial, we are sort of bound by budgets, um, but how, to, how we have to sort of make ways around that is maybe by looking at partnerships or, or trying to get funding elsewhere or, or maybe minimising what we're doing, making it sm smaller. PCs, um, it's quite challenging though, especially in these sort of economic times. Um, sometimes time's a challenge as well. Some of the lecturers, if um, they're wanting to, to do a, a great project, we just have really strict prep time. And, and as you know, prep time just goes um, because you're trying to prep. I think people that, that think we prep practical courses, we've actually got double the work. You're, you're prepping for a practical demonstration. You're prepping for a, a, a lecture at the same time. You're sort of doing assessments and things. So it's trying to find time uh, to, to do all these implements and implement all these changes. Um, sometimes there's challenges from maybe management, support, you know, trying to get support when we are trying to implement great changes or environmental changes. Um, and changing the mindset maybe of, of people and, and sort of making them, raising awareness with them of what we do. Uh, I think also CPD is very important to us. So we are learning as much as students are learning at the moment and there's so much to learn. So it's encouraging um, the team and the staff to sort of go on training. If there's any sort of symposiums, any sort of um, activities they want to, to get involved in. For example, when we went up to the Glasgow School of Art, to do the eco-patination workshop, 
Um, we've been to a climate um, emergency for arts um, convention. And it's just things like that that maybe help us understand what's going on as well and how we can then feed that back into the classroom. But on the right, I've got sort of the benefits, which far we out the, the sort of challenges, and that's maybe the quality of work, the student engagement um, that's came from all, implementing all these changes, um, our partnerships, um, the less, less waste. Um, we've found that over the past few years, there's been so much less waste within the department from all the changes, um, even going so far as just even looking at the, the gas torches that are at every bench and making sure that um, they're all switched off if there's no soldiering happening um, and just seeing little by little how we can sort of implement it. Um, and even though there's financial challenges, there has been financial benefits to the college where they have saved a lot of money by us just recycling um, in-house. Um, and I think just having the, the open discussions with students, even just spending 10 minutes in part of a classroom time of discussing about where, where the metal's coming from and, and where it, what they're planning to do with it and where it'll end up. Um, and just even if it opens up more questions than it does answers, at least it gets them sort of thinking about it. And that's sort of, uh, that's the end of the slides. Um, I've got that sort of a uh, link here. Whoops, um, I'll just stop sharing. Sorry, I don't think, I don't know if the link worked, but basically um, I'll put into the chat the link to our YouTube channel because it's got a lot of um, videos that we're welcome to share all about um, the work that we do at the college. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me as well. Lisa, that was wonderful. Um, that really gave us a deep dive into a whole variety of ways that um, various institutions might tackle this. Thank you very much for um, sharing. Um, for time purposes, please, any thoughts you're having, anything, plop it into the chat, put it in, because this is going to become um, a resource for us going forward um, on how we further integrate and collaborate um, on uh, responsible sourcing and sustainability in jewelry education. So everything that you want to see and put in here. Um, and because we might run out of time for questions, because we'd like to now go to Karen Smith and give her the platform to share um, her work and about uh, We Wield the Hammer. And so Karen, you know, before you start in with your conversation, I wanted to ask you, um, We Wield the Hammer is filling a really specific need in the jewelry industry. Um, you have kind of lasered in on um, a particular audience who's been left behind in conventional jewelry education and so on. And so before you get started, I was curious if what you're seeing with the pledge and uh, what you're hearing from other jewelry and metalsmithing educators uh, across the ocean, how how do you do you see it as a tool that uh, you could use as well, or do you see what you're doing as um, being kind of a specific segment of that pledge? How would you like us to think about what you're doing? Um, I would like us to think about what I'm doing as um, as meeting uh, a tenant of that pledge um, because. I think that there's a way that we think about DEI. Everybody talks about DEI right now. Oh, we got to get diversity and inclusion and whatever. And what that gets reduced to is let's get a couple of Black people in here, right? Or, oh, George Floyd died and we realized that there's not enough Black people around. And um, that's reductive and it's actually not helpful because what I keep seeing um, and what I think we don't talk about enough is, um, is what real diversity would look like in the industry. What real diversity would look like, um, I mean, we, we, real equity and inclusion would look like. Because so many times a lot of the discussion is, is narrow. So it's like, let's get some black people in here and train them to be bench jewelers. 
except the industry is huge, right? Like I don't hear us talking about how we can get people of color and working class people and more women in leadership roles and um, how we can get, you know, there's a way that I don't think we talk enough about what diversity actually is. How can we get more, um, how can we get more uh, suppliers that we can then exchange with? I have been invited to um, uh, work with the Jewelry and Gem Association of Africa. And like they are really, uh, they are really concerned with getting um, more equity for Africans in the gym industry, right? Because you know Africans do the mining and everybody else makes the money, right? And so if we're talking about like sustainability and and equality and inclusion. Um, there, we need to be talking about it all the way around. Um, um, I love some of the things that Lisa said when she was talking about quality of work and that kind of thing. And there's been so many ways. I've talked to so many jewelers who are not white and not wealthy and don't have access, right? So they may not have been trained in these top schools and, you know, and they don't network with a lot of the, um, a lot of the well-known um, uh, masters and what have you. And, you know, they have said, oh, we don't get to show at, you know, X place. Um, and I don't think it's important to mention names, but we don't get to show in this place here in the UK because, you know, um, we're told that the quality of our work is not that great, right? Um, and if that's true, right? Who's mentoring these people who, who to, to get the quality of their work up? Who decides, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm certainly not here in any way to suggest that we um, accept substandard work, that we um, ignore um, the importance of, of um, training and you know, apprenticing and, you know, all the things that are important, all the steps that are important to creating beautiful work. But I think there's a way um, that this conversation, when we talk about who has access to jewelry education and, you know, what the students are learning versus what they should be learning, uh, not versus, and what they should be learning. Like, I think we need to broaden that out. I would like to, you know, suss that out. And I think you're right, Christina, I have honed in on a specific uh, market um, and that is young women um, uh, uh, 14 to 24 of African descent um, because that's where my interests are. Those are the people who um, historically have been left out around the world not just here, um, for a number of reasons, not just gender, for economic reasons, for cultural reasons. Like there's so many reasons why, you know, the last people to get um, access uh, in, this, in this extraordinary, extraordinary vocation and art form is black women. And so like, that's how I have honed in but my interests are not simply about that. Like I always want to call attention to the fact that accessibility um, is not just making sure you bring a you know a black person in and said, "Wow, look now we're diverse," because that doesn't help. If you bring in a black person, if they're going to do something for the community, then okay, maybe. But do you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I think we, I would like us to suss out what it means more. Um, and when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about ethical making, when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about it 
all the way around. I'm not just interested in seeing more black bench jewelers, right? I'm interested in seeing more black jewelry professors, right? Like I'm interested in seeing more black um, people at uh, the organizations that um, have a lot of impact in the industry. I'm interested, and not just black people, right? Um, but you know, that's where I come down on the side. Um, but yeah, does that answer yeah. your question? It does. Um, I think I think everyone's ears um, just kind of lit up listening to what you're saying, and um, you know. You also, um, based on your experience, can clue us in a, a little bit on how a jewelry education works in another country, in an African country, for example, Senegal, where you went to study. And um, due to sort of the structure of the culture, it was surprising to everyone that a woman was in the jewelry studio with a man Ooh. learning. And um, if you, if you could talk a little bit about the inspiration for you when you saw the young girl watching you learn and kind of like what, what that meant and how, how um, you know, expanding on what you were just talking about, we can kind of support that. So I think that's a very inspiring story um, that if we are, if we, you know, white folks keep in our minds, you know, like the things to look for to generate opportunities, that one particular experience that you had is worth sharing with everyone if they don't know it. You, it's written up on your website, but it's just. <laughs> well, in a nutshell, um, I think I, I, in a nutshell, I decided to create a, uh, an apprenticeship for myself uh, because I woke up one day and decided that I wanted to learn more, um, more traditional skills, more, um, more accessible ways to make jewelry. Um, and some of that had to do with the fact that I was learning how to become a metal artist, but I could not afford, for instance, to go, and I did not want to go to, you know, an academy or to get, you know, an MFA or something like that. You know, I, I had a background in academia. I didn't have any more debt and I didn't want to take on more debt. And I just thought there has to be a way to learn this without going into deep debt, right? I did not, I couldn't afford it. And that's number one, like, you know, there has to be alternative ways to get trained to do this. Um, so, um, with a lot of luck and, uh, the connections of a couple of friends, I got an internship, uh, an apprenticeship with a master goldsmith in Senegal, but, um, I was warned that, uh, women don't wield the hammer. And so that would be an issue in Senegal. And, you know, it, it it's the truth. I recognize that my privilege and my connection got me this apprenticeship. And, you know, it was really challenging because, you know, I was the only woman there. Um, there were lots of men around, some of whom, you know, were sort of incredulous that I was there. Um, and, but there were also young girls and women who would just like walk by and, 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 and react to seeing me doing this work. And there was one kid who just every day would just come and stare at me. And, you know, she would never speak to me because, she, you know, she just, I did not understand why she didn't speak to me. But it turns out she didn't speak to me because she had never seen a woman doing anything like what I was doing, like with fire or with hammers or with files or with a draw plate. Like she had never seen a woman doing that kind of work. And so she was sort of stunned. And my teacher's son said that she thought I was a ghost, which I still find a little bit funny um, because she had not seen another woman do that. And I recognize now that you, is, when you see someone do something, then you can dream it for yourself. 
right? And if she now wants to learn how to do this work because she was getting close to the age where apprenticeship would start for her, who's going to teach her? Because the transmission goes from father to son to son, you know? Um, and that's how this program was born. But also, you know, as I, um, as I want to do, I did my research, I read a lot about it, and you know, in lots of places around the world, that's how it happens. You know, um, the, the, the work is transmitted from one person to another, um, and they're the chosen whether that be because they are family, whether that be because they're men, whether it be, you know, whatever it is, um, they're the chosen ones and we have that system here. So the chosen ones are the ones who can afford, you know, uh, to go to jewelry school. Um, the chosen ones are the ones who even know that jewelry school exists, right? Like there are people who don't even know that they can go to school and get a degree in jewelry making in 2022, right? Um, so, I mean, when I think about who has access to jewelry education, it's not, I, I want to think broader than, um, well, you know, Black people have been left out of this because it's not that simple, you know? And then I want to think about how you know, we can come along. One of the challenges that I've had, I started this program and I've had a lot of challenges because, you know, people don't care about arts education, right? And I'm not a fancy school, right? And so a lot of the support that we have gotten, believe it or not, has come from individual jewelers, which is amazing, right? But like trying to get like the support that we need um, has been really, really challenging because, you know, who am I to think that I can start a program training young women? You know, I mean, there are some people who have been very inspired by my story and some people who have been like, who does she think she is? You know, um, and not even in a, not even in a malicious way, but just sort of in a, in a curious way, like, who does she think she is? Why can't people just go to university? You know, and as we know, every year, less and less people are choosing university because of the costs and often because they don't even know. And so like, it's really, it's really important to me that when we talk about sustainability around uh, our, our, like cultural and economic sustainability, we are not like that we open this conversation up, right? Um, which also leads to what you do afterwards, right? I became a metal artist and I started a program to train young women. So I'm paying it forward as it is. Part of our plan, uh, our program is free, but you know, part of the vision is that people who come through this program and then they move on to the next phase of training is you know, they're committed to like, coming back in some way or making a way for the next person, even if it's just one by one, because that's how change begins. So, you know, I know we're running out of time, but um, it's really important to me that when we talk about these things, we talk about mentorships, like how we mentor people in all aspects. So we're not just like channeling people to the bench only um, as, you know, something that we're calling diversity and equity and inclusion, you know, um, that we're not, that we are creating sustainability for people who go into this um, industry and what they want to do. It's really, really important. And when we talk about quality of work, you know, um, it's really, really important that there are, there, there is support all the way around if we are genuinely talking about affecting and effecting change. Yeah, that is a very, very important point, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, it's not about just checking a box. It's not about doing a single thing. It's 
how do we it, it, we have to continue to do the work it's a continual process and um i think mentorship is such a huge huge part of that um continuing to pay it forward as you said um so you know let's just continue with y'all drop your questions in the in, in the chat so that we can um give karen most of the rest of the time we'll just go up until almost 10 30. Um, I want to make sure you are able to share what you uh, were planning on sharing all around. Um, if you want to tell us about the future plans of We Will the Hammer, I'm really excited to hear about the growth that you are uh, experiencing and planning or anything else that you wanted to make sure to share with us. Um, well, if we will the hammer. <laughs> one of the one of the challenges that we've had is finding affordable is find an affordable studio space. Um, you know, I started the program in Oakland and we initially were um, working out of an industrial arts school where I was also um, on joint faculty and that didn't work out because we didn't have enough autonomy. Like we need our own studio just as anyone else does. But in the Bay Area, the cost of living and the cost of leasing is astronomical. And so like we have really been, you know, slowed down um, on top of COVID with that. And here in Durham, where I am now opening, hoping to start the studio here, it's been the same thing because, you know, um, gentrification is killing arts education around this country. And so, you know, I have made the decision to try to find us a place um, to purchase, you know, even if it's just like a tiny little plot of land and we put like a little building on it. Um, <laughs> we have to find creative solutions to, um, to our hindrances. And because I don't have a mentor, right? Like I decided that I wanted to do this and, you know, I just did it and I have flown by the seat of my pants. Um, and thank God I'm fairly intelligent, you know, like, thank God I'm fairly resourceful. I've been able to move forward in a lot of ways, but, you know, it's been a challenge just getting studio space. Like, it's it's bananas. And, you know, we have a 501c3, you know, and I've had people say to me, someone should just donate you a building. <laughs> and I think that would be great. Who would that be? Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, you know, there are, there are many ways that people can support us. Um, uh, now that they know, now, now that you know that I have a 501c3, when you give donations, they go directly to us. You can decide when you make a donation, if you want us to go to operating expenses, if you want it to go to, um, uh, whatever tools and what have you but more than anything like we are in need of building a strong working board right because again I'm one person who does not have a background in arts education or in nonprofit work and I'm really proud of how far I have gotten us um and you know, the support of an active working board is absolutely necessary um, because we are a 501c3. Um, so, you know, there are ways that we could stand that kind of support. It is not just um, donations, individual donations, although I always like to express my gratitude because we would not have gotten anywhere if it wasn't for regular metalsmiths going, yes, I, this is fantastic. I didn't have any opportunity like this and I want to support you. Here's 50 bucks, you know, or here's a hundred bucks. It's been extraordinary. And it's been mostly and largely women. And, um, and I'm really, really grateful for what has happened and could stand uh, um, administrative and structural support and a building if someone wants to give it to us. <laughs> Karen, if if I had a building, I you would be the first one. I'd be like, yes, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but it's getting my wheels turning, you know, I'm like, I have a tiny studio space. Maybe I can, you know, host one student sometimes. So, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's getting the wheels turning for sure. Um, and, and, you know, the ask for support that you're, you, that you just brought up, I was immediately thinking, you know, through CMC, we, um, that's kind of like what we want to do here is like just pool resources, connect people. And we have Shane in the chat saying, Karen, let's talk. This is what I do. So, you know, hopefully we can, um, part of starting this conversation and this collaborative process can be just to make those connections as well. So, yeah. Sweet. We'll keep, we'll keep this going. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great segue, um, Anna. Uh, I want to thank um, Dr. Karen Westland, Lisa McGovern, and Karen Smith, all three of you, for sharing your insights with this group. Um, so, really, the idea, the core of this, you know, we met um, months ago to, you know, we talked with. Curtis Arima and Russell Larman at California College of the Arts, Susie Gonch at Virginia Commonwealth University has been working on this for years. Clearly in Europe, you know, in Scotland, um, this work has been in progress in the UK. I know Peter Oakley has been on, he's been really working on these things for a long time. So we're part of, if I missed anyone, my apologies. You know, we wouldn't have met Karen Westland in person had it not been for initiatives in art and culture in New York in July. So, you know, we are all working together to create an ecosystem that, you know, rises, rises the tide. Um, and so the, the vision next is that somehow we don't know what it looks like yet. There is an ongoing conversation, an ongoing supportive and also, you know, looking critically conversation on how we can make these improvements. The next milestone in terms of a public kind of um, furtherance of this discussion is with Ethical Metalsmiths and the Education Committee and their annual um, international state of practice. It's also a webinar, um, but we're hoping that now, you know, we're going to take some of the topics that came up today, keep them in front of the eyes of the panelists, um, the various organizations, so that we can highlight some priorities. And, you know, I don't know if we're going to end up with a standard or some kind of certification for schools, but I'm certain we're going to arrive at, um, you know, with the pledge as a roadmap, a deepening under each one of those categories of things that institutions can do, individuals can do um, to support um, a system of jewelry education that um, works for everyone and the planet. Um, so um, there are more things popping in the chat. Anna, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, I think that's a great wrap up and just keeping in mind that, you know, this is, yeah, we really want to, we hope to keep you all activated so that this is like a, uh, it's not just a conversation that we're, you know, we're forming these connections and working groups and all of that, but we kind of want to be the facilitator for that as much as we can. Um, so please, please, please keep in touch. Um, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, we hope to see um, everyone next month um, in November. Uh, the laws we have to abide by are interesting and looking at it through um, the lens of sustainability and inclusiveness, et cetera, is important too, because the laws aren't Sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. <laughs> and so we have to, you know, look at a critical eye with all of that. So again, a final thank you to everyone. Really, we're really grateful um, for the preparation that you did um, leading up to this. Um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of the month of October and we'll see you in November. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks yeah, for thank so much. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, Lisa, Karen, and Karen, if you want to, after everyone logs off, if you want to stay on for a second, you're welcome to. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>